second. Melvin, would you do me a favor, please, and go get me a bottle of water? Thank you. I'm not used to wearing hearing devices. I want to make sure I have this turned on. Can you hear me now? Nope. I press the button, it's green. In the back, can you hear me now? It, uh, it, okay, thank you. You never know, I might get thirsty during my sermons. They usually last about two hours. <laughs> it's a blessing to be with you once again today, and appreciate the opportunity to fill in for Sean. I have to admit, I played a dirty trick on him last night at about 8 o'clock. I sent him a text with one of those frown faces, and I said, my wife and I are really sick with COVID. I can't be there tomorrow. <laughs> and then, instead of putting a smiley face at the end, I said, just kidding. <laughs> and he texted back, and he said, you got me on that one. And uh, he sent me a picture of a baboon, wasn't it? That was his response. It was his video picture of a baboon, and I, I replied, and I never did get a response to this. I said, you sure look better there than you did a week ago. <laughs> but anyway, it's a blessing to be here with you this morning, and as I mentioned, I'm appreciative of the opportunity to fill in for Sean. He decided to stay here this morning so he could take notes and correct my false teachings afterwards. <laughs> and uh, we want to thank you, that is, Loanne and I want to thank you for uh, your friendliness. You know, there's a real difference between a smaller congregation and a larger one, besides numbers. Larger ones, you tend to get lost in the crowd. It's not that way with a smaller one, people... A lot of people come up and say, hi, it's good to see you, even if you don't know them, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. We attended two larger churches, that is uh, six Sundays in a row of uh, two churches of, I would guess, 200 people in attendance on Sunday morning. And by the time we were done with the sixth Sunday, we thought, let's go somewhere else. So we went to another church. Of Both of these churches, by the way, are, are gospel preaching churches, and they have good music and good preaching and things like that. But it, was just, it just proved the difference between how you can get lost in a crowd. The second one, I suppose, had 200 people in attendance regularly in the morning. And in both churches, it was kind of like when you go to Perkins or the Millstone or wherever you go out to eat, and uh, you see people there, but nobody stops. You don't go over to people you don't know and shake their hand <coughs> at a restaurant usually. And uh, so we're appreciative of the friendliness of this congregation. Now, if it keeps growing and there's 200, I'm not going to complain about that. It'll just take longer. <laughs> It'll just take longer for us to greet one another, right? <laughs> And uh, so don't think that big churches are always better. They're not. And uh, we wanna, I want to thank uh, uh, Alvin and the music team for the good music. There's a good balance between old and new. That's nice. Some people only like old music. Some people like only newer music in church. And there's a good blend of new and old. And that's a blessing. And I appreciate Sean's preaching and teaching too. And I hope that you do. It's good that he takes the congregation through the Bible chapter by chapter. And that's a very, very helpful thing uh, for a congregation to be under that kind of preaching ministry. And uh, I also like the fact that he 
He's not abrasive in his preaching. Have you ever been to a church where you felt like you got beat up uh, halfway through the sermon? Well, he preaches the truth, and he applies it to daily life, but it's not in an abrasive way, and that's a very good thing. And a, a third thing I like about his preaching is his sermons aren't real long. <laughs> and uh, that's a good thing. You know, culture has changed so that, so that uh, people can't take long sermons like they used to, or at least like they used to have to take. And have you ever, did you ever watch, or maybe you still do watch reruns of Andy Griffith and Barney Fife? And did you see that episode where Andy and Barney were in church on a Sunday morning, and uh, they both were asleep, and uh, they both were real comfortable, their eyes were closed, and I saw that, I think, in a, you know, when it first aired years ago, but I also saw it on Facebook as a picture. And the caption with Barney and him asleep in the pew and other people gathered around there sitting in the chairs and whatnot. And the caption said, there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> well, I'm watching the clock even though I can't see it. I'm going to uh, set my watch here so I can tell approximately how long I have been going on. Well, we are going to be looking at something in the Gospel of Luke. I read through Luke's Gospel again recently for my daily Bible reading, and maybe you did the same thing. And I remember Pastor Sean preached through it chapter by chapter not too many weeks ago. And uh, as I was reading through Luke's Gospel once again recently, I noticed a certain theme being mentioned a few different times, and that theme is faith. Faith is referred to in different ways in the Bible. We, we're we going to be thinking about some verses that use the word faith this morning. I'm preaching from what might be the church's official Bible translation, the Christian Standard Bible. I don't know if that's the official one here, but, but uh, I have read a lot in it, and uh, over the more recent years, as well as in other Bible translations. But because I think it might be the official one, I'm going to be preaching through this uh, during this message today where we find this word faith. But faith is referred to in other ways in the Bible, like believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That's referring to having faith in him, is it not? And so that is what we're going to be looking at this morning, some biblical statements in which the word faith is found and that have some very practical applications to daily Christian living. But before we get into those statements in the Gospel of Luke, I want to draw our attention to the fact that there are three kinds of faith. You might have thought this through yourselves. There's what we call personal faith, just like I mentioned, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. We exercise personal faith Every day, don't we? When we eat at a restaurant, you're exercising faith. Uh, if you ever get invited to my home for a meal, don't worry, I won't be the cook. That would be a step of recklessness, not faith. <laughs> my wife will provide a good, safe meal, safe to eat. But when you eat uh, food, whether it's from a restaurant or out of a package, you are taking a step of faith. If you cross a bridge with your car or on foot, you're taking a step of faith. If you take your prescriptions, you're taking a step of faith. Uh, there are countless ways in which we exercise personal faith every day. But there's also what we might call a doctrinal faith. Doctrinal faith. And the Bible has a lot to say about the subject of doctrine. and That is biblical or theological teaching. And we can say that we adhere to the Christian faith. Sure, that might be personal, but it has to do with the fundamental teachings of the Christian faith as they are revealed to us in the Bible. So there's personal faith, there's doctrinal faith, and last but not least on my list 
is uh, what I wrote down here as denominational faith. Every denomination has its distinctives. Baptists have their distinctives. Uh, Lutherans have their distinctives. Catholics have their distinctive teachings. Methodists have theirs. You know, whatever denomination it is, they have uh, or we have uh, our own distinctive teachings. And uh, they are something that we should get familiar with. Have you ever gone through the list of the fundamental, the fundamentals of the Baptist faith? And, uh, for instance, the word B, the letter B in Baptist, can stand for biblical authority. We turn to the Word of God as Bible-believing Baptists, and not Baptists only are this way, I realize that. But we turn to the Word of God for what we should believe and how we should behave. Then when you think about the letter A in the word Baptist, that stands for the autonomy of the local church. Uh, this church is autonomous, yes. It's a part of the Southern Baptist Convention, but it makes up its own decisions, calls its own leaders, so on and so forth. So it's autonomous, independent in its government. Then when you think about the letter P in the word Baptist, that can refer to the priesthood of all believers. We, if we are saved, we are all part of God's priesthood. We don't have, in Baptist churches, we don't have priests. We have preachers. Uh, we have pastors. But if we're saved, we're all priests. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Then as you move along in that word Baptist, after the letter P, you find the letter T. And this refers to Another distinctive of Baptist churches, and that is, uh, we believe in two ordinances of the local church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And moving on quickly, I, I, I shouldn't elaborate too much on any of these, but moving on to the I there, we find that it, it stands for, or can stand for, what we call individual soul liberty. And sure, this church has certain expectations. The Baptist denomination has certain beliefs, but there's a point at which ultimately we're held accountable directly to God himself. And so we, we don't believe in having, uh, having authority over people's consciences. And that's a very, very practical thing too. Uh, and it deserves discussion and more, but I'm not trying to elaborate on all of these. When we come to the letter S, we believe in a saved church membership in Bible-believing Baptist churches. Does, doesn't mean that every member of a church is saved, but they should be able to give a credible testimony to the fact that they have been saved. And that's a very valuable thing. So we don't have infant members. We have those who are old enough to have believed on the Lord Jesus as their Savior and uh, been saved and, and can tell us about that. And then we also believe in two officers of the local church. We usually call them pastor and deacons. And then last but not least, we believe in the separation of church and state. We don't want a government-run church, do we? Not at all. And uh, we'll follow the laws of the land so long as it doesn't cause us to contradict the Word of God. And uh, we don't want them telling us what to believe and how to behave, within reason anyway. And uh, so we believe in these distinctives. So remember, when you think about faith, uh, there's personal faith, there's doctrinal faith, then there's denominational faith. And we just went briefly through those things that make up a, uh, a Bible-believing Baptist church. Now, let's return to the theme of this sermon. And that is, in case you forgot with all of that information, that is, we're going to be thinking from the Gospel of Luke about some statements that we find there about faith, personal faith. So, let's turn, first of all, to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5.
as we look at some of these verses, and we don't have time to go over all of them by any stretch of the imagination today, unless we want to have a very long church service. Uh, we're just going to go through a few of the verses in the Gospel of Luke that specifically refer to faith. And uh, we go then to Luke chapter 5, and I want to read to you verses 17 through 26. Luke 5, 17 through 26 from the Christian Standard Bible. On one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem, and the Lord's power to heal was in him. Just then, some men carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They tried to bring him in and set him down before him. Since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles in the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that striking? Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to think to themselves, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, Why are you thinking this in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Verses 25 and 26 will end our reading. Immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. Then everyone was astounded, and they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, We have seen incredible things today. Well, the key verse to which I want to draw your attention is in verse 20, which I want to read once again. Verse 20 says, Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. What can we learn about personal faith? Two things here in verse 20, I see, and uh, very practical in nature. One of them is faith. And I'm talking about genuine faith now. Faith in Christ can be seen. Isn't that what it says? Seeing their faith. And so we find that there's quite an emphasis on this subject throughout, especially throughout the New Testament. And you think perhaps of James chapter 2, when James elaborated on the fact that faith without works is dead. He went on to say, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And faith is a heart matter. It is uh, something that only God knows for sure if we have genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if it's real, he'll know that. And if it's real, it'll become visible. Somehow, some way, and it can be in a multitude of ways throughout our Christian lives, we will be demonstrating by by things in our lives, how we talk, what we say, uh, what we do, you know, just the general tenor of our life, we will show that we have genuine saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, Luke chapter 5, verse 20, does tell us that he saw their faith. Now, you can kind of picture it. I can reach up and touch this ceiling. <laughs> I have a son who, and so does Loan. <laughs> we, we share a son. I think his head would probably hit the ceiling. right? Here. But anyway, uh, back in those days, roofs were a little bit different than they are here, more like they might be in warmer climates, less advanced cultures and so forth. And so that's what we read about there in Luke chapter 5. And uh, Jesus saw not just the faith of the ones who took the tiles apart and let him down through there, but he was able to see into their hearts, and therefore he saw into the heart of the paralyzed man, and he, he saw genuine faith in him too. And so he said to 
all of them, including that individual, through, through his ability to see into the hearts. Uh, your faith, isn't that striking? Your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So point number one here from Luke chapter 5 is if we have saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to show up throughout our lives. Sometimes it's very dramatic, like the Apostle Paul's conversion. Sometimes uh, we're of a more quieter nature and maybe get saved uh, at very young ages. And uh, we're, you know, a lot of people get saved when they're four years old, according to their testimony. And uh, that's a perfectly legitimate thing. And they might grow up in a good home that, you know, they don't, they don't drink, they don't chew, and they never ran with those who do. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but their faith still shows up sooner or later. They will demonstrate it, even if they have a quiet nature, more reserved type of a personality. And isn't it wonderful to know that those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ not only have a visible faith, but they have had their sins forgiven. They have had their sins forgiven. At the very moment of placing one's faith in the Lord Jesus, all of the guilt is removed from God's sight. All of, uh, and there are a lot of people in this world who have lived some very wicked lives. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm talking to some, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you're looking at one, though. And uh, the wonderful thing is, when we truly convert to Christ, we have saving faith in Him, no matter what our sins might have been, and they could uh, fill up the back of a semi-trailer, you know, the, the amount of sins that we have committed in a lifetime. But all of those are forgiven the moment we are, are uh, converted to Christ, the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that wonderful to know? There is nobody that we... No, who, though humanly speaking, they are beyond salvation. In God's mind, that's not a problem. If they genuinely believe in the Lord Jesus, they are instantly forgiven of all their guilt. Let's think about something from Luke chapter 7 now. Luke chapter 7 has another reference to faith. While you're turning, I'm going to take a sip of water. Luke chapter 7 has a similar theme here. I want to read verses 36 through 50 of Luke 7. Luke 7, 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. <laughs> you can just about laugh at the, the silliness of that statement, as though he weren't one. She was a certain kind of sinner, though. That was his point. It says, uh, verse 40, Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, Say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. 
You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, we just thought about that from Luke chapter 5, didn't we? But let's move on here to verse 49. Those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we saw in Luke chapter 5 how faith brought forgiveness. Here we see different wording used. Your faith has saved you. He could look into her heart and... uh, and also by you know, experiencing her contrition, her repentance, her remorse over her wicked lifestyle, uh, he could see her faith. It was a demonstration of it. But isn't it great that he said to her, your faith has saved you. And uh, there's a very important subject right there. There are a lot of people who I think are probably genuine Christians but they struggle with assurance of salvation. They think to themselves, I know that I believed in Christ, but am I really saved? And they might think, I know that I believed in Christ. I accepted him as my Savior at uh, some point. It might have been fairly recently from their thinking this or maybe you know, in the distant past. And they think, but, but uh, I'm inconsistent in my Christian life. Am I really saved or not? Well, This woman, who lived a very sordid life, had a lot to overcome, really. She was told by Jesus, your faith has saved you. That's very personal, isn't it? He didn't just say, faith saves everybody. He says, your faith has saved you. It wasn't her faith, it was her faith in him that brought her salvation. And so if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, He saved you. Hallelujah. Uh, If you have received him as your Savior, he has saved you. And that's something that can bring a great deal of comfort to us as we go through the struggles of life. We want to move on now to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I started out during this sermon preparation a week ago. I started out after having read through the Gospel of Luke, once again, looking up these verses that make reference to faith, and I came up with nine different ones to look at. And I thought, no, that's way too many for one sermon. So uh, we're not covering all of them, but I'm not telling you how many that I have left on my sheet of paper. <laughs> not, many, not too many, really. Uh, We want to look at uh, something significant in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 48. This will not take very long, but I think it will have a practical meaning for us. And so in Luke chapter 8, we want to read, starting with verse 40. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Jesus then, a man named Jairus, just then, excuse me, a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. You know, that was Peter's way of saying, how are we supposed to know that? (laughs) Verse 46 Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. 
In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. And so verse 48 is our key verse, which happens to be the last one here. It says, Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, sometimes the word saved is used in Scripture in more than one way. Just like we, we use it in more than one way. We can say we were saved from a serious car accident. We can say we had a serious illness and uh, through the medical profession we were saved from death. That's a very common way for us to refer or to use the word saved. But here, when Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you, go in peace, he's talking about spiritual salvation. But isn't it very, very striking that this woman had been healed? And the point I want to make here from this passage is a simple one. Faith in Christ sometimes brings physical healing. Now, I'm not a healing preacher, and uh, but I do believe God can heal. I'm sure all of us here who know the Lord, we would say, yes, God can heal. When he wants to, if it's according to his will and for his glory and our good, he can, he can intervene. He can step right into our physical illness, as it were, and bring healing. Sometimes, like this case, it's instant. He might decide in his own wisdom and in his own uh, judgment that he's going to heal us, but he's going to let it take a while for reasons only he might know. But it's good to know that we can receive divine healing. I'm not suggesting that Christ died to heal everybody or that he died to heal all Christians from their illnesses. I'm not suggesting that at all. That is not taught in the Word of God. But let us, if I can put it in such streety terms, let's take a chance on it sometime and say, Lord, you can do great and mighty things. Would you mind healing me of this, this uh, cancer, this whatever it might be? And he can, when it's his good will, he can do a great and mighty thing on our behalf. Well, I see our time is just about up. So, I'm going to skip one point and go to my last one. That tells you that I have five on my sheet of paper, but we're going to look at, skip one and go to the last one. So, turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. We want to see something very significant in Luke chapter 22. I want to read 31 through 34. Luke 22, 31 through 34. Simon, Simon, this is Jesus speaking. Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, and when you have turned back, strengthened your brothers. Lord, he told him, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I tell you, Peter, he said, the rooster will not crow today until you deny three times that you know me. Peter's self-confidence was evidence here. But it, uh, it, he was overly confident in his own ability to resist the circumstances in which he found himself. And Jesus knew he was going to fall flat on his face. He knew he was going to deny him in spite of his saying, I will never deny you. And uh, what I want us to think here, the main point I'm making from this is found in our key verse, which is verse 32. I have prayed for you that your, that your faith may not fail. The Lord's in heaven at the Father's right hand, and he's doing the same thing right now. He's praying for us. I'm sorry. 
It's a touching thought. He's praying for us. And that's why we're still saved. It's not because we're so loyal or whatever. It's because It's because he's praying for us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So we don't need to think, oh, that. I might lose my salvation someday. You can say, hallelujah, I'm saved for good because Jesus is praying for me. Well, we have come to some simple thoughts from Luke's gospel on the subject of faith. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Sean. When I go to some conferences, the guy after the preacher feels compelled to re-preach the sermon. So just hang petty. <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much. I, I love that message on faith. I'm so grateful for you and, and being here today. And I'm just so, so grateful for you all. It felt good to sit in church today. Who knew it could be a blessing to, to be in the, the pew there. Alvin, will you lead us in our last song together?